Hi guys, I'm Shana Knight and I run a mental health service for children and young people. And I'm here today at Shevington Vale Primary School to create a therapeutic classroom. My name's Andy, uh, Andy Horton, um, and I am a primary school head teacher. Um, I'm based at Shevington Vale Primary School. My school is in Apley Bridge, um, which is a rural area of Wigan, just outside um, of Wigan, about three miles away. We're a one-form entry primary school, currently 196 on roll. Um, we operate at the moment between about 12% and 25% of our children in each class um, are classed as SEND. I'm very fortunate I get to work at a, an amazing school. Um, I genuinely, I'm, I'm one of those annoying people who likes coming to work. Um, so yeah, that, that, that is me and, and, and my school. We have been working with this school for about a year, even through the pandemic, and they've been taking part in our Therapeutic School Award. Now, that is a year-long programme where they've got to do a series of different things in order to achieve therapeutic status with us at TPC Therapy. Today is a very special day because we're coming in and we're going to create a therapeutic classroom. Now this isn't part of the award, this is something that I approached the head teacher about a while ago now and he agreed to do. So what we're doing is we're going to create the ultimate therapeutic classroom. What that means is we're changing our usual and standard classrooms and making them more therapeutic, which means that they're going to be able to encapsulate more of the children's mental health and wellbeing needs. It's a polar thing, behaviour in, in school. Behaviour in society, I think, is, is a, a big issue. So if, if everything was sort of um, like a Care Bear world, we wouldn't have the horrific things that we see today. But then you, you look at where those horrific things stem from and the reasons behind things. And as human beings, you always look for that why. Why has that awful thing happened? Why has that person done that? And a lot of it, actually, when you tap into it, it starts at childhood, that's the truth, is that so much of what we become as, as human beings is based upon quite a short period of our lives. Actually, a lot of research tells us that between zero and five is where the magic happens, so to speak. So I think in, in schools, and in primary schools in particular, you've got to you've got to get it right. You've got to get it right, or at least strive to be getting it right, because the foundations are laid now. Um, and as much as we're not the primary educator, because there is a whole different argument for parental responsibility, of course, there won't, and there always will be, but they're with us a lot, you know, 180 days a year, six hours a day. You know, we've, we've looked at it as it's well over a thousand hours. So, they're with us a while, you know, so we can have quite a large impact. Um, so how we are and the relationships we build with those children will definitely have a huge impact upon the people that they then later, you know, become. Um, so your behaviour is everything. You can have the best curriculum in the world. You can have the most gorgeous libraries. But if your behaviour isn't on point, your school will always amount to nothing and that's and that is the the, the sort of the, the bugbear of it I think for for a lot of people. So a therapeutic classroom puts mental health and well-being at the core of everything that you do. It's almost like we're bringing in a whole school approach to mental health and well-being and looking at everything that's around that child including environment. So in my first sort of approach to headship I knew Behaviour didn't need to change, that would be wrong for me to say that, but what I knew we needed was a better focus on behaviour because we weren't getting it right. We were still guilty of um, what I would say is sort of snapping. We were too snappy in classes and, you know, when there's a sort of uh, teacher meme about it, like the tutting chair. We had a tutting chair, you know, you'd put a child outside the head's office and you'd walk past them tuts, you know, it was, it was that. Not a culture as such, um, because it's always been a lovely school to work in, but there was this kind of, there wasn't really a, a systematic approach or an understanding of behaviour. There was just kind of, let's put that fire out, let's put that fire out, let's put that fire out. Um, and that, you know, it's messy. It, that's the only way I could describe it is that it was messy. 
Um, so we, we, we went on this approach of sort of positive reinforcement and, and looking at catching children being good. Um, and what we, we found was that it was working. However, there was this percentage of children who, regardless of what we did, were still struggling. Um, and we realised quite quickly that the behaviour policy needed to come from them. Because if you can get it right for that small percentage, the rest of children, they just it doesn't matter for them. So 98% of children will come in every single day and knock it out of the park regardless. They just will do. So their behaviour policy doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because they'll still be dream kids. They'll still hold open the door. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But your behaviour policy needs to really come from those children who struggle every single day just to come in. Because if you write the behaviour policy with them in mind, then it doesn't matter for the others because they'll conform regardless. Um, and that's, again, if you think about it, that's just society, isn't it? You know, generally, most of us will just wake up in the morning, do what we can, get on with it, and we'll all have our own issues in life. However, there is a small proportion of society which have got real serious issues. So, you know, amendments in life need to be made for those people. It's no different in a school. Um, so it's a case, it's a case of flipping it. That's what we needed to do. However, when we started thinking that way, it's quite niche. It's not really, there's not much out there because education tries to create a system for everyone, doesn't it? You know, it's, it's gotta be a system that everyone can turn up, come to school regardless and be okay. And that's really tough to squeeze all of those triangle shapes into those square holes. Um, and fortunately, um, Jill, the assistant head, went on like a conference and uh, Shahana was speaking at it and she came back. And in, in fairness to Jill, she's really good. She, she sees through a lot. Um, and she said, you know, this is, this is something that we are talking about. This is something that we are missing. So it wasn't that we went and thought, God, we need to rewrite the script. It was uh, actually we went and thought, yes, you know, finally, someone on a similar sort of wavelength to us. We weren't feeling alien anymore. It was, uh, so it was someone wasn't coming in and going, you need to do this, you need to change this. It was someone coming in and going, yes, you're doing this right. However, you need to think about this and back this up. Um, so that was definitely the, the attraction because it, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't someone coming in like the Messiah and saying, just buy me in and I'll fix everything because that's not how it works, you know. Um, th this is an ever-changing environment, um, but it was someone coming in and providing the staff support, the background knowledge, those little nuggets, uh, sayings, what to say in this instant, what to respond with in this instant. And when, when you sort of listen to the train, even, you know, even in my position as a head, it's very much like, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of worked hand in hand, I suppose, with the journey that we were sort of already on. Often we forget about our environments, but they actually create and cultivate a space where a child can feel inspired to learn. And that's what we're trying to achieve with our therapeutic classroom. Our therapeutic classrooms will strip back everything that we expect from a normal classroom and start again. We're basically reinventing the classroom space. What we need to start to do is look at every aspect. What is on the boards and why? Where are children sitting and why? Can they get up? Can they move around? What are some of the things that maybe aren't working? You know, are children uncomfortable throughout the day? We often see children fidgeting or sitting on knees. And that shows that the children are losing concentration and they're not able to engage. We've got to start doing something about that. One of the other things that we need to consider here is that those external factors, like staying up late or having issues at home and struggling with other things, for those children, when they come into our school, they're going to have high stress levels running around their body. Now, what we need to do is to acknowledge that. We need to come from an tra trauma-informed perspective. We also need to start to be a little bit more attachment aware when we're looking at the environments that we create for our children. If they've got very high stress levels, then actually their learning brain is not on. Instead, they're going to be working from a place of survival. They're going to be tired. They're going to need to meet their own needs. They're going to struggle to engage and listen and concentrate, to reflect and to learn and to retain information. Now we cannot expect children to learn in an environment that doesn't lend itself to 
being trauma informed and even being aware of children's well-being and mental health. If they've got really high stress levels, we need to bring those stress levels down before they can learn. And our conventional classrooms don't do that. My name is Laura Hart and I have been, I only qualified last year as a teacher, so I'm a newly qualified teacher. Um, so this is my first full year of teaching. And it's been different with everything that's going on. Um, so it's not been as what I imagined, but it has been fun. Sometimes children can be very unsettled, um, so they need a calm environment. And behaviour wise, I think it's been a, quite difficult the last year with how unsettled it's been with lockdowns and um, changes. But I think coming into this new environment will be good and it will bring a calm environment for the children and I think it'll settle them better when they come in. Some people take it too seriously and there's too much emphasis on behaviour and don't breathe or there's the schools where it isn't a focus and then you'd argue that those classrooms become unsafe. So it's a balancing act and I'd say that that is hourly, not just daily, you have got to get those things right. Um, but from, from our point of view, because it's not just mine, is that if you're human about it, you'll, you've got a good foundation. So ultimately, these are small human beings. Some of them have been on the planet, you know, 48 months or whatever, and they're with us in our nurseries. So to expect them to conform to a certain ruling every single moment of every single day, regardless of what's going on in their lives, it's, it's a ridiculous ask. So in terms of your behavior policy and your approach, we try and come at it from a human angle, right? So what must that feel like for that child? What must it be like to be in this lesson? And when you start reflecting and asking these sorts of questions, behavior policies write themselves, um, you know, and there are days we get it wrong. And, and you know, uh, and there are days we learn tough lessons, um, but I think as long as we constantly are trying to come at it from a human angle, from a human point of view, where actually what we do today, we hope will make you better throughout the rest of your days with us and beyond, we're on the right track. Now, there are lots of things about a normal classroom that actually can create barriers to learning for children. If you look behind me now, there is a lot of things on this wall that can be quite overwhelming for a lot of children. Lots of bright colours, lots of laminated things stuck around. We often have things hanging in classrooms. We have lots and lots of information on boards. We have fluorescent lighting, very, very bright lighting. We have uncomfortable seating, often plastic chairs and tables that have been around for the last 50 years, if not longer than that. And actually that doesn't create and cultivate an environment for children to be able to learn. What we need to start to do is look at the world that the children are living in now. There are lots of things that are affecting children when they come into our classroom and we need to take that into consideration if we're actually going to embed a whole school mental health and wellbeing approach. So if you think about our children, very often they are staying up late, they're playing on Xboxes or Playstations, they're gaming, they might be on technology for long periods of time, they might have late bedtimes or irregular bedtimes. It might be that they're also struggling with things. So maybe they've got a large family or a new sibling, or maybe they struggle and they're quite vulnerable. We work with lots of schools in vulnerable areas that children are experiencing things like domestic violence or loss or abuse. Now those children come into our school and we expect them to sit down and just learn. And actually there are a lot of things that are going to stop that child from being able to access the learning environment, create good relationships, engage with their teacher and actually get the best from their learning and be able to learn and be able to remember and recall and you know to be able to perform in the way that we expect. Hi I'm Jill Handley I'm the assistant head teacher here at Shevington Vale. I'm also the year three teacher which is a class of 28. Um, I've been teaching 10 years now um, and have taught across school in reception um, year two and now year three and I'm really excited for this opportunity. I think what doesn't work about the conventional classroom at the moment, it's hard furniture, uncomfortable seating, 
children are up and down um, on the knees, trying to get comfortable or trying to find a comfy position to work in. Um, some of our classrooms are still very bright um, and can disrupt the learning. Uh, so just trying to make it as comfortable as possible really for the children to really be inspired to learn there. If I'm feeling stressed and overwhelmed, if I'm tired, if I've got low self-esteem and I come into a classroom like this, I'm going to feel bombarded. I'm going to feel more stressed. I'm not going to be able to be calmed by my environment and then start to learn. And that's what we're trying to achieve here with our therapeutic classroom. I would choose to sit here every single day over a plastic chair with a straight back against a hard wooden desk where my chest is at the wrong height for starters. We're here to do our therapeutic classroom makeover. Now all of the children know and we've chosen a year three class to do this with. What we're here today to do is to gather all of the things that we've ordered over the last few months and put them in place. And then on Monday, we're going to do a full reveal to the class so that they can see what a therapeutic room really looks like. They're then going to spend the next year living in that space and working in that space so that we can see what a therapeutic classroom really does with regards to impact long term. We really hope to make a homely, um, relaxed environment um, that the children can just feel really comfortable in, um, inspired to learn. Um, we've made different areas in the classroom, so there's a comfortable seating area where they can choose to cuddle up and read a story uh, on the sofa, or they can choose to sit on the high bar seats um, and look out the window. Areas where they can be near to the board or further away if they want to work independently. I have some concerns um, about how it'll affect teaching. Um, obviously the children are very used to the normal routines, giving out the books at the tables is very easy. Um, obviously they'll have to get used to the higher tables, um, where all the resources are kept, um, and just obviously the speed of how we can then get ready for lessons. Um, in regards to the classroom, um, I'm feeling very excited. It's going to look amazing. Um, the children were really excited when we told them all about it as well. Um, obviously I'm a little bit nervous about the time scale of getting everything done and then also just the um, work that's going to have to go into getting the children comfortable in the environment and getting them used to the, the new routines, um, little things like places, pegs they were worried about so it's just reintroducing those things again of all the new areas. So with the new classroom makeover I hope it will achieve a happy, safe environment for the children and it's somewhere they can come into a classroom and feel relaxed and safe and ready to work. My only concern with the new makeover is that um, with behaviour, um, whether how they will react, how they will transition into this new environment. Um, but hopefully I think it will, it seems calmer already and I think it will impact the children in that way and they will come into a nice calm classroom and they will respect it more than the last classroom. I think the staff will feel calmer because they feel like they're at home. I feel like it will be, I think the other staff will want their classrooms done the same as well. Uh, but no, I think it will impact us all. I think it'll be really good and it, it'll set a calm environment and it will transition well from the old classroom. I truly believe that we've already we've already got a wonderful school, you know. So I, I truly believe that those twenty eight children would come in on Monday happy to be here regardless. You know, that's all that that's our aim. If we can make it better for them, then the goal has been achieved. That's you know, it's not a, a it's not a high bar to set, um, but that's what we're here to do. Um, you know, uh, and if their academic outcomes can improve because of that, again, just that's just a bonus.
Um, I think long term, when I look at the room and the areas that we've got, the dream, I suppose, would be to make a school like this, you know, to have not just pockets of it, just to have it running through your school and for it to be normalised, not for it to be a, oh, look at that, for it to be, yeah, this is, this is just our school, this is just the way we do it, and for it not to be questioned, so for it not to be, well, what do they behave like? Do they look after those chairs? You know, for it just to be like, give over, of course they do. You know, like, that's just ingrained in us. Um, and I think from what I've seen already in terms of our library and in terms of the, the lounge intervention room, it, it will work, you know, eventually <laughs> it will work. Obviously there's tweaks, Laura and Jill have got some legwork, I suppose, and, and you know, the, the, the kids will have high expectations, but it, it will work. Yeah. Okay, so here we are, it's reveal day. The children are all waiting to come and see what their classroom looks like. And we've been working really, really hard to make this room therapeutic. So let's have a sneak peek before they get to see it. In terms of the environment, we, um, we've, all, we've got a staff book sort of list the, um, of the texts that we've read and one of them is uh, Ron Berger in, in education. He was quite famous for the um, Austin butterfly which is where we got a child to draw um, a butterfly and the, the whole class critiqued it and each time the, the butterfly got better and better and better. Well he had this statement in, in his book Ethics of Excellence which is that um, we spend so much money on making buildings beautiful, but it's all the banks um, and sort of like Canary Wharf in London. And if what we really value in society, our hospitals and our schools should be our beautiful buildings. And I think that really struck a chord with us because we were fortunate to get a, a, a refurbishment in 2017, but it was a very standard looking school. And, you know, breeze block on show, a lot of colourful displays that, don't get me wrong, a lot of effort had gone into, but really after a month looked horrendous. Um, kids were forever picking staples out the wall and things. So we made this sort of commitment that each time we redid a room, we would make it beautiful. That, you know, that, because what happens in here is, is important. You know, we're, we're sat in the library now, the most important room in a school. It's got to look the best. You know, you're daft if it's just a cupboard full of books. Because, you know, what does that say to children? That, it's that broken window syndrome, isn't it? Is that, you know, we, we've noticed with everything, we've we changed our workbooks from these standard exercise books. Don't get me wrong, the work in them was still wonderful. There's no denying that. Um, but we just gave them a laminated version with a school logo on the front and guidelines inside. And our presentation went through the roof overnight, just overnight, because it suddenly became a book that they could be proud of it was they didn't know that we'd spent one pound 79 on each book instead of 59p they genuinely didn't know that but it just resonates doesn't it you know so 
those sorts of things um, that have been brought in through the therapeutic schooling was all, again it was hand in hand with what we were already thinking um, so it's you know it's, 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 it's certainly been a positive um, connection definitely this doesn't look like your average classroom i know that we're actually in our library area of the year three classroom and we wanted to create a feel that feels very much like home somewhere safe and secure and like they belong so we've got a beautiful sofa area and we've also got pictures behind us of all of the children in the class so it feels very much like their space we've also got all of the reading books that you would have within your library area displayed in a way that you might find within your home so that when the children come in it really feels like their space so what we've got here is a dining table and we've brought this in because we know that in a classroom the children need to sit together, they need to sit to be able to talk to each other, do group work and teachers might need to lead a little group. So we needed to create spaces within a classroom to allow for that but we didn't want the conventional tables and chairs, the low tables with the plastic chairs around it. This feels a lot more friendly and a lot more comfortable and accessible and again more homely. So that's why we've gone for a dining table. One of the things that's really important about a therapeutic classroom is the seating. Now, in your normal classroom, we have those plastic chairs, don't we? And we've had those plastic chairs for about 50 years, maybe longer, and they actually don't work very well. We're expecting children to sit down for long periods of time and continue to concentrate and to be engaged and to be able to learn. And actually, they're not going to be able to do that. Those seats don't lend themselves well to children being able to feel comfortable. So what you get is you get children fidgeting, you get children sitting on their knees or children swinging on their chairs. If you're a teacher, you know how often children swing on their chairs. What we want to do is create seating where children actually feel comfortable. And it's about reducing those stress levels. If they come in, they're feeling stressed, they can sit down and the seats feel relaxing and comfortable. So then they're gonna be able to learn. Their thinking learning brain is gonna come on and they're gonna be more engaged. So we've gone for very soft, comfortable seating in lots of different types of, of ways, lots of different ways. We've created bar stools, we've got some sofas, we've got some um, armchairs and dining room chairs, and that gives the children an opportunity to sit somewhere that feels relaxing. Now, I know when I work, I need to move around. I might put my feet up when I'm writing an essay or a magazine article. I might need to sit low against the ground. I might need to sit high up. And I can choose that because I'm an adult and I can move my body when I don't feel comfortable. We don't give the children the same opportunity to move their bodies when they feel uncomfortable. We expect them to sit for long periods of time and continue to sustain their, their level of concentration. And then when they don't, we tell them off. And that's what's not working and what we're trying to change with our seating. This part of the room is really special. Now, often when we're teaching, we ask our children to sit on the carpet or we ask our children to sit on their chairs and look at the board or look at us. What we wanted to create here was a space where children could break out when maybe they're listening to instructions, listening to a story or listening to a lesson being taught where they don't have to actually do anything. And we wanted to create a space where they could come in and just be relaxed and comfortable. Some children like to lie down and that isn't about them being silly. They need to lie down. They need the pressure from the floor because maybe they're feeling a bit stressed or a bit anxious. They need to be able to feel like they can move their body in a way that's comfortable to them because that's going to get their brain going. It's going to get them listening. Some children just might listen better when they're laid down and that's okay. So we've created zones where children can lie on floor cushions, sit on low seating and just sit on the floor in a way that shows that our room reflects the needs of the children and allows them to do that. Again, coming from a place of being attachment aware and trauma informed. Now, the seating is really special. They can sit here, they can chill out, they can read, they can listen, they can gather together and do group work or talk. And it's just another space within the room that adds a dynamic to the room that isn't just sitting on a really hard floor, listening and looking at the board. Now, what you might have noticed in this classroom is that there are no backboards and there are no display boards, and that's done purposely. What we've done instead is we've created this beautiful photo wall of all of the children in the class. Now, what happens is every time a child joins the class, their photo goes on the wall. 
These are pictures that remind the children that they are individuals within this space and that we're like a family in this class. It makes them feel like they belong and that is really important. Sometimes when we have our backboards with all the children's work on, it can actually cause children to feel quite anxious. So imagine if your work isn't great. Imagine if you've already got low self-esteem, you don't think your maths work was very good and suddenly all the maths work that is good goes up on the board and yours isn't on there. That's going to perpetuate those feelings of having low self-esteem, not being good enough and not being able to achieve and it's going to affect the children's mindset. This has the complete opposite effect. It makes them feel really worthy and really good and it raises self-esteem. And that's what we want to achieve in our classroom spaces. It's also not overwhelming. We've done them in black and white. Often our backboards are really, really quite colorful and that can bombard children. It can be really difficult to see what the work is they're supposed to be looking at on the board. Sometimes we have spellings on there, keywords on there. We have working walls. Well, if you're sat really far away from the board, how are you supposed to see it? This replaces that and it has a lot more value for the children when they come into the room. In fact, this room won't have backboards. It will be completely different. We may have frames with pieces of work in and we may have things that we pin up and add into the room, but we will not have the conventional backboard with your borders and all of the work plastered on it because it doesn't suit the purpose anymore. So let's talk about lighting. Now, in your conventional classroom, you usually have really bright fluorescent lights, don't you? And that can often be quite distracting and a little bit overwhelming. If you think about for yourself, if you've ever been in a classroom or in a clinical environment where the lights are really bright, you get those dots in front of your eyes. And I'm sure children get that quite a lot in our classrooms. What we want to do is create an environment that feels cozy, warm and safe, because that's going to help them to start to learn. If they're feeling overwhelmed or stressed or even tired, really bright lights can actually distract them from their learning and create this sense of feeling unsettled. What we want to do is create a sense of peace. So we introduce floor lighting and lamps and we turn off the fluorescent lights to really help to create a mood within the classroom that's then going to help the children to learn and to be able to learn and have that concentration and that thinking brain turned on. Now you might be wondering why we've got blankets in our room. And that is again to create this sense of safety and security for children. Children who have insecure attachment can often come into classrooms and just feel really overwhelmed by the environment and by the expectations of the room. You might find children running out, running down corridors, getting really angry, completely disassociating from the work and refusing to engage. Blankets can really help with that. If you have a blanket, you can pull the blanket over you, you can put the blanket around you, and you can create a sense of security just with the blanket. So we've included lots and lots of blankets in this area, so children have the opportunity to just grab one and snuggle up to it whenever they feel the need to. Now they might not know they're doing that, but the fact that it's in the room, again, is trauma-informed and helps us to give the children what they need just by using our environment. And actually, they don't have to ask for it, they can just search that out for themselves and then utilize the space. Another really important feature of a therapeutic classroom is plants. Now we've introduced lots of fake plants because it's really hard to keep real plants alive. But plants are really good for your mental health and your well-being. That's why getting out in nature is so important. Now the children can't get out in nature as much as we would like when they're in a school environment. So we're bringing the outside in. This school is really lucky because they've got gorgeous views of rolling hills and we've actually positioned our desks so that they can look out at that view. The other children in the classroom can't and so we've introduced beautiful plants and although they're fake, they will really help with the children's sense of well-being. It's, it's not as, uh, I don't think it's as simple as, it, it's a human thing that is, is missing. I think every single school has such a unique context that it has to adapt and do things so differently. I, I'm able to do things here because my community are brilliant. You know, they don't question it. They're just like, yeah, Brill. You know, we, we don't get letters from parents saying, why are you doing this or why are you doing this or what, what money have you spent on that? Genuinely, it's not. It's, you know, they trust us to just go with it, um, which I'm very fortunate. And I know that some schools probably don't have that. 
you know, do perhaps get a lot more flack, so can't stick their neck out as much for fear of the backlash. Um, and I truly believe deep down in all schools, because I don't know why else you'd be a teacher, because it's a, it's a hard enough job as it is, and if you don't like kids, you're done for. But it, it, I think everyone does ultimately begin coming at it from a human approach. I do think that. I think that gets lost in the bureaucracy of it all. Um, and we can get too swept away with these sort of fads and these things that just quick fixes, you know, behavior problems, shout a little louder, you know, noisy classrooms, have silent corridors. And yeah, short term, brilliant, no doubt in my mind. And some teachers generally need to, to look at strategies in order to create silent rooms. I'll, you know, I'll, I don't disagree with those statements. But if you have got children in your school like we do, and I would argue like every school does, you need more than that. You need more than that. You need to understand what their needs are and how you can meet them. And here, we don't meet every need. We've got a long way to go. Um, and I'd argue we may never do because the funding isn't there or the system behind schools isn't there. You know, there's a lot more to schools than just education, but we're not backed up well enough in the mental health aspect and in the health aspect. Um, so those areas have got to clean out their own closets as well. Um, but I think if, if every school was looking at their children of most need, and starting everything from their point of view, we'd we'd be all right. We'd probably be in a better position th than what we find ourselves in today. And interestingly, the, the people that beat schools the most, Ofsted, if you if you read a lot of their publications, that is essentially what they're saying. <laughs> Although it's mixed messaging and and some of it gets lost in translation, um, but they are focused upon your SEND children and your, your, your pupil premium children because they're the most vulnerable in our society. We've got to get it right for them first. You know, we have to. Um, so I think that the tide is changing. It's just whether or not, um, you know, like you said before, that, that, that schools are, are, have the ability to stick their neck out, you know, um, and, and, and can do it. Um, we're, you know, we're by no means, we've not completed education. Um, but I feel and I hope you know my staff do and from speaking to them I know so and, and from speaking to the children that are here that generally everyone comes in knows what they need to do and as simple as that is that's what works you know they come in this door feel good you know are supported the children are happy and those that are struggling are supported and that's all right, you know, and, and, and daily there will be big changes, but 98% of the time it's bang on. And I don't think anyone really can ask for more than that. So my first question is, what do you think about your new classroom? Amazing. Amazing. Do you love it? Yeah, yeah. it's really in thumbs up. I think it's comfy. And I think it's a good environment for learning. Do you? Why is it a good environment for learning? Because it's very calming and you don't get stressed. I love that. That's really good to know. What do you like about your new classroom? So you can relax on the chairs. I like the bit where the shirts are more comfy so I can concentrate better. It's comfy. It's comfy. And it has high chairs with, and it has my bean bag with mattress. The area where um, the, but the board is, it's a bit like a lounge. Yeah, it's more like a living room, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. My favourite bit is um, being able to see the board because it's the chairs are higher up. Oh yeah, I didn't think about that. Because before you were really low and now you're really high you can see the whole classroom in the board. Yeah, and it is a better view because you can see everything. I like the couch because it has more blankies on it. It does. We can get a blanket and snuggle up. Yeah. I like the chairs and the tables and the reading corner. 
Why do you like the reading corner? Because it's nice and comfy. Why is it important that it's comfy? So you can relax and, and read. Yeah, do you think you'd be able to read better if you're comfy? Yeah. Yeah, rather than being uncomfortable. I think you're probably right. Because it feels like home. It feels like home. Why is it important that it feels like home? Because it feels safer. I like I like it because it's better than before because everything's more comfy and it's more it's more better and I like the pictures on the wall. Before I didn't put the pictures and it brings a lot of memory from year two. Why is it better than before? Because when we used to have when we used to have no cushions or anything, it, the chairs were really, really hard and we couldn't concentrate better. But since we've got the good cushions and that we can learn better, we can learn proper things. We're comfy so we can do more of our work better. We don't have to worry about our backs or our legs. That's really good, so it's distracting when you're yeah. uncomfortable. Ah. So you, you can just put your feet down like that. But on the other chairs you had to kneel up. What I didn't like was because I was swinging and it was too hard. And do you know the bit where I had a gap? Yeah. That bit wasn't good. No. That holy bit. Yeah, it hurt my back. Yeah, I remember that from when I was at school. It hurt my back a little bit. Yeah. Like, so I had to lie, like, so I had to move forward a little bit. Because like it by here because then there's like then, a jumper there's like, stuck and then there's like a squirt on your back. Yeah. We hurt our bottoms on the chair. Did you? Everybody said that. I think that's a really big problem with classrooms. When you're in this classroom, how does it make you feel? Very safe. Nice. Safe? Actually, yeah. <laughs> Very safe. Very safe. Why does it make you feel safe? Because like it's a bit yeah. like home, and you know that home is your safe place. I love that. It feels like your home. That's a really good one. Do you think all classrooms should be like this? Yeah, because some classrooms, when people are being silly, they might not listen or anything, so they need that classroom to concentrate. So every every person in the world deserves a, com a comfy class and so they can concentrate with like comfy chairs and stuff. The truth is, what we need to do is consider the fact that the numbers of children suffering with adverse childhood experiences are rising. What that means is children are more likely in today's society to be struggling with abuse, domestic violence, loss, maybe they're in care, maybe they've got really stressful home situations because they haven't got a lot of money. Those things are going to affect our children when they come into school and our school environment needs to take that into consideration so that the children can learn to flourish. They should not be defined by their trauma and our environments need to take that into consideration so that we can help them to learn and be their very best selves. Now, our classrooms at the moment, our normal classrooms, don't feel like a place where children can really come in and be their true self. If they're tired, if they're stressed, if they are struggling with something, those are the things they're gonna be thinking about when they walk in, not maths or English or handwriting. So what we want to do is to create a sense of home, to create a sense of belonging, so that when children come here, they feel safe. It's a very scary world out there if you don't feel safe if you don't know what time dinner is, if you don't know whether dad's gonna be drunk in the evening or whether you're gonna be able to go to bed on time or whether someone's gonna be on drugs. Those things are really difficult. When our children come to school, we've got to create a sense of safety before we can expect them to learn. Because if they don't feel safe, they're not going to learn. They're going to constantly be in a place of survival. And we're gonna see really difficult behavior. We're gonna see children kicking off, we're going to see children running out. We're going to see children getting really angry. And that's when behaviour becomes a problem. Our environments can do a lot to help with that. And actually, that doesn't take much from the teacher at all. Now, a therapeutic classroom also includes therapeutic ways of working and therapeutic language. And classrooms like this will really help with that. If children can come in and start to release some of that stress, and feel safer and more secure, more comfortable and more relaxed, 
and to know that in this space they are emotionally safe, then we're going to get the best out of them with regards to academic achievements. But never mind just academic achievements, we're also going to get the best out of them for their life. They're going to be able to learn about who they are, they're going to be able to learn about their confidence, their well-being, they're going to have positive mindset and what we're doing is we're shaping children to be able to learn that their trauma does not have to define them and that starts within the classroom.